thought we'd come down here and just plug our refrigeration in and um, it was it was a shock. It was a shock. Matthew is now responsible for at least 283 deaths in Haiti. We'll be with you throughout the night. Everybody has a little bit different time period, but we all are going to get totally impacted by this storm. And I thought, my gosh, should I have uh, evacuated my family? Uh, and uh, what's our city going to look like? It looked like almost like, like a tornado had gone through it. It was that everything was thrown about so much. With a new hurricane season upon us, Channel 4 looks into the lives of those who are still feeling the pain of this disaster. Some people are still living in the nightmare of Hurricane Matthew today. Why experts warn that it's only a matter of time before a hurricane directly hits our coast. At some point, we're going to roll snake eyes, and we're going to get that severe hurricane to come into North Florida, southeast Georgia as well. If a direct landfall occurs, this will be unlike any hurricane in modern era. And why the leaders of Florida's coastal communities worry people won't evacuate when they should. If there's one thing that I can make very clear to everybody that's watching this broadcast, if that storm had not jostled to the right, taken a jig to the right a little bit two hours before it hit, there would have been decimation in Jacksonville Beach and there would have been hundreds of people killed. My name is Joan Galasso. My husband Jerry and I own the Matanzas Inlet Restaurant here in Summerhaven. We've owned it for 25 years. We had quite a few celebrities stop in over the course of 25 years. Uh, Kenny Chesney spent the afternoon here. Coaches from the University of Florida. It was a very much of a local place. It's bird sanctuary and it's national park right across the way and it's just stunning. I have refrigerators, triple door freezers back there that are, that are toppled. That's one of our boots. Oh my gosh. That was in the dining room that was on that wall there that wound up in the kitchen. This just took my heart out. May 2017, seven months after Matthew, the Golasso restaurant still looks like this. It was the most life-changing event in my life. It certainly was. We were here making a good living. We had a great sense of, we had awesome help. Our staff was just aces. That was the hardest part, was, was uh, knowing that, you know, they, we weren't all gonna be together anymore. We were actually writing about this storm potentially impacting somewhere almost two weeks before it did because the ingredients for a powerful Caribbean style storm, a major hurricane that is off season, was already baked into cake. You could see it real quick in the beginning. The Jaguars were playing in London uh, when I first got a call about uh, a potential threat from a storm. Uh, and then the Monday of the storm, if I remember correctly, was when we had a, uh, back in the emergency operations center, a full debriefing on, on what could be coming at us. About 10 days before the storm, John Gaughan called me on my cell phone. And, and, and I can tell you in nine years, he's never done that. And he said to me, there's a storm that's spinning, or getting ready to start spinning towards us, and I think this one's gonna be serious. We find the Hurricane Hunter reports the highest winds. They're going to be right in this zone here, and those winds have been up to 145 miles an hour. 
did not compare at all to any recent storms in our history. In fact, most locals recall the 2004 hurricane season when we were impacted by Jean and Francis, and those were only tropical storm strength uh, when they impacted the first coast area. And even getting back into the early 60s, even in comparison to Dora, Matthew in itself was its own beast. At one point, we were anticipating the potential of a Category 4 storm just offshore of Palm Coast. And our area had not seen a storm of that magnitude, that intensity, since 1898. Matthew was unique. In fact, it was a record breaker. According to the National Hurricane Center, Matthew reached Category 5 intensity at the lowest latitude ever recorded in the Atlantic Basin, and it was intense. Just two and a half days after it was named, it grew to a Category 5 storm and set its sights on Haiti. It skirted the Caribbean nation as a Category 4 storm with winds topping out at 156 miles per hour. Over 500 people died there and the storm's projected path didn't look good for Florida. One long swipe up the heavily populated coast with very little margin for error. In Northeast Florida, the storm was projected to hit at one of the worst possible times, high tide. The wind, there's nothing that you can do really to protect yourself. You know, you can uh, board up the windows and things like that, baby steps in, in how much damage could really come through but water goes everywhere. And unless you get away from it, there's no way to protect yourself from it. I think I can speak for the whole team to say we were really worried that a lot of people may be trapped on the other side of that intercoastal. We knew we were gonna get impacted here in Northeast Florida. The question was, is it gonna be Floyd part two? If you remember 1999, massive traffic jams up and down 95, I-10, total standstill, people abandoning their cars as they were leaving from South Florida to go to Central Florida, to go to North Florida, to get to Western Florida, to get away from Floyd, which was another very large hurricane. With the thought of the potential of another major traffic tie-up, like that caused by the evacuations order during Hurricane Floyd, government leaders mulled over the implications of ordering another evacuation. You want to make sure when you choose to evacuate a zone uh, that it's a real threat, uh, because if you have to ever evacuate again, you want people to take the threat seriously. But with the storm as big as it was, and moving even closer, around one and a half million Floridians were ordered to leave. About 500,000 of them were in Duval County. I know it's a pain to, to go through all the trouble of evacuating, finding a place to stay in Lake City or Live Oak or Gainesville or wherever you're gonna go. The, the monetary expense, the inconvenience, it, it, it all seems to be a tremendous pain, but I'll tell you what, it's a lot less pain than watching your children die. The words are blunt. Government leaders say they had to be leading up to the storm because Matthew had the potential to be a killer. Matthew was unique in the sense that he fired up so intensely out there in the Caribbean. It was like a big red warning sign that something bad's about to happen. And on Thursday, October 6th, with an updated model from Hurricane Hunters, a Category 4 or 5 storm plowing somewhere along the shore of Northeast Florida looked like a distinct possibility. Evacuate. The storm will kill you. Time is running out. They didn't evacuate, and my mother just called me, and the ocean water is surrounding their house. The chilling cry for help made at the height of the storm why some say it should serve as a distressing warning to leave the next time an evacuation order is issued. People say, I'm gonna ride it out. They get in trouble, they pick up the phone and try and call the police or the fire department and no one's there. Originally from St. Augustine, and this is the only street I ever wanted to be on. The Bayfront and the historic section it's great, you're right across from the intercoastal, you're two blocks from downtown, it, it's what St. Augustine's all about. We're seeing Matthew continue to remain very impressive, a very strong Category 4 hurricane. The Hurricane Center, like Tom mentioned, will have an update. Head of the storm, I put everything, or as much as I could, on top of tables. I took uh, many small pieces upstairs, um, I sandbagged around the openings uh, around the house. 
barricaded the front door since the water figured the surge would come in that way. The water came up much higher than I thought. The storm hit right there at high tide and the water came up through the air vents under the house and came up through the floors for five hours and receded. So this is my foyer here and you can see that this is the high water mark that came in, which ended up being 20 inches over the floor that was here. This is, was, will be my living room again. All the um, oak floors came up and the subfloors here expose this. You can see the new beams I put in. I think you're in shock. I was in shock for the first probably eight weeks trying to figure out what I could save and working with the insurance companies. Living upstairs, that worked out perfect for this um, because some friends are staying in apartments. Um, other people in Davis Shores are in motorhomes or campers. It's, uh, we're all doing what it takes and I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to be at my house. Definitely gonna be more respectful when Category 3 is headed our way. Thursday, October 6th, one day before Hurricane Matthew was expected to cuff the coastline of Northeast Florida. Gosh, I can continue to come to these briefings, all we do, all of us do with the National Weather Service, and I keep hoping that uh, I'll hear some good news, that the track has changed. Uh, that's simply not the case. Uh, this remains a catastrophic storm. An updated forecast model showed the storm going from bad to worse. National Weather Service meteorologist Angie and Yeti was helping to brief the public from the Emergency Operations Center in Jacksonville. I remember um, before going out and doing the public briefing, the news conference, um, it was a Thursday morning and the forecast had changed. Uh, significantly and it was very dire. That's where I got that gut feeling in my stomach of when we were anticipating the Category 4 storm sitting the center of it, the center of it, which is very small in comparison to the, the storm itself, offshore of Palm Coast, Florida by about five miles. The peak in intensity right now is looking like it's going to be tomorrow afternoon through tomorrow night for the wind speeds. The peak magnitudes inland, and when I say inland, I'm talking west of the intercoastal, are looking like 60 to 80 sustained with gusts up to 100 miles an hour. Along the coast, we're looking for sustained of 90 to 115 miles an hour with gusts to 130 miles an hour. So in addition to the surge, the wind is also going to be incredibly devastating, even to well-built structures. I remember using that verbiage of that our, our topography will be changed and a generation upon generations will be talking about this storm. And those are the words that I used in the executive briefing and you could have heard a pin drop in that room. It was, it was very solemn. At Channel 4, the newsroom received the very same dire forecast. Catherine Bonfield, our news director, comes to me and says, you need to go out there and make a personal statement to the viewers. And so Mary and I sit down at the desk and I start, I put aside, I'm the newsman. A lot of people say, oh, there's the newsman. I said, listen, I'm not the newsman. I'm just Tom. And you and I, the viewers, we have a relationship that goes back more than 40 years. So I'm gonna read you this warning from Noah. And when I started reading it, I became very emotional because it's frightening what I'm reading. I wanna to talk to you people for just a minute. Not, not as Tom the newsman. We, <laughs> we've been together for 40 years, you and I. It's time to take precautions. It's time to protect yourself. Um, this is not gonna be like anything that we've ever seen before. Tom's simple, heartfelt reading of the forecast went viral. Since October 2nd, 1898, there is no local living memory of the potential of this event. Its direct landfall occurs. If a direct landfall occurs, this will be unlike any hurricane in modern era. 
And all these years that we've had, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, no, it's not, it's going somewhere else. All these years, it now looks like we're gonna get hit. It's, it's finally, heaven forbid, our turn. When Tom started talking about that, I didn't know what to think, what to do. I think it was my instinct to just reach over and touch him as a, you know, as a um, person who was very near and dear to me. And I knew he was getting choked up. It was very, it was a moment, I will say that. It really was. With an even more intense storm heading toward them, city leaders continued their full court press to get people to evacuate. If you are in an evacuation zone, if you are at the beach of cities and you do not leave, you are making a really bad decision not following these orders. What I wanted the people of Jacksonville to hear from me and understand with great clarity is that if you are in an evacuation zone, uh, this is a very dangerous storm and I need you to leave. While city leaders hammered home the message of evacuating flood zones, journalists headed to them. I remember standing there in Hurricane Matthew thinking, how did I find myself as this new mother in the middle of a Category 3 hurricane? Channel 4 investigative reporter Lindsay Gardner covered St. Augustine during Matthew. I live in Jacksonville Beach. You know, they had already tried to, the evacuations were already underway there. My house had already been closed up. So she could work, and so her husband could tend to his beach's business after the storm. They had a gut-wrenching decision to make concerning their baby girl, Sadie. We don't have family here, so I had to make the last-minute decision. I called my parents up in Georgia, and I said, will you just start driving, and will you meet my nanny somewhere and take my baby and our, our two dogs? And I called my nanny, and she threw them in the car, and I didn't even get to hug her goodbye. And she wasn't even a year old yet. And my nanny, I just trusted her to pack her up and take her out for the day for I didn't know how long at the time because we didn't know how devastating the storm was going to be. We didn't know when we were going to get power or water back. Uh, so I just remember being in the back room of the station trying to get out the door for the day to cover my assignment but make that last second decision and call my husband at work and say, hey, I've decided to evacuate Sadie and we don't even get a chance to hug her goodbye. When the storm approached, it, it became a little emotional, you know, it, because I grew up here in Jacksonville. This is the city that I know. This is the city that I love. There's so many people that mean so much to me. Channel 4 reporter Vic Michelucci covered Jacksonville's beaches communities during Matthew, but just weeks before had covered the widespread damage caused by Hurricane Hermine, which plowed into Florida's Gulf Coast. And I just didn't want to see our people go through this because a major hurricane can take years to recover from. I spent a lot of time talking to our meteorologists before this. I was always talking to John Gaughan and Richard Nunn and Rebecca Berry saying, hey, what's this gonna be like? How bad is it really gonna be? And I remember even a week before John Gaughan turning to me and saying, this one could get ugly. This might be the one. This could be a hurricane like we haven't seen in our lifetimes. And when our experts, who I genuinely trust say that, you listen, you heed the warning. You're sending people out into what you know is one of the most, if not the most dangerous situation they could possibly face because it's their job. When you sit in my seat and you know that you're sending these people out to do this stuff, you know, you think about it, you think about it a lot. Friday, October 7th, the day Hurricane Matthew was projected to get perilously close to the shores of Northeast Florida. A small boom could mean a lot. It could mean the difference between life and death. But then, a sliver of hope. So I had laid down for a few hours uh, during the early morning hours, Friday morning, from like about 1 to 4 a.m. And I got up and I started looking at satellite imagery and I saw the center of the storm start to take this little wobble off to the northeast. And I was tired. I was afraid I might be seeing things. So I called my office and I was like, hey, you guys, you guys see what I'm seeing? They're like, yeah, it's starting to take a little jog off to the northeast. And it was deviating from the official forecast track a little bit, but it was deviating in the right direction. And with that one wobble, kept him off the coast all the way past Jacksonville. 
a single wobble on a Wednesday afternoon. It, it was that wobble, really, that saved us from so much more damage. That slight jog to the east has saved Jacksonville. You saw me and sampled those radars just off the coast. Had the storm just been 10, 15 miles west, Tom and Mary, the impact would have been far greater. When I briefed that, that observation during the early morning hours of Friday uh, to the mayor and to the commissioners, um, to the Jacksonville, to the, the beaches mayors, I should say, um, I, I didn't want to convey that, hey, we're in the clear, we're good. That was by no means the message, but the amount of devastation, the potential devastation had decreased significantly, even just with that 20 miles of difference uh, farther off shore. So I don't want to say I was relieved. I, I, I was actually. I would say I did have some relief Friday morning, being able to brief. It's taking a jog in the right direction, which is farther offshore. How do you pray uh, about a, a, a very dangerous storm that's coming at you? Because you certainly, you don't want your city impacted, but you also don't want any other city impacted. So I just said a simple prayer that that thing would wobble and it would have as little impact as possible. I got down, I kneeled down, I crouched down and I started to pray. And I said, please God, just, just save us, protect our people. Sure enough, read into it how you'd like. This storm was tracking east, a little bit further away from the coast. So we were still gonna get hit by it, but we weren't gonna get the worst. Coming up, Matthew may not have given its worst, but what it did bring was bad enough. A man who filmed some of the most dramatic images of Matthew's waves beating up local beaches, his experience of riding out the storm in an oceanfront condo. I think if I made the decision to do every I probably wouldn't do it. If you're planning on leaving, now's the time to go. It's speed limit on Beach Boulevard, it's speed limit exiting the beaches, it's speed limit on the interstates, now's the time to go. This storm has been described as one that is historic. And quite frankly, neither Nikki nor I or anybody else here at this station wants to sit back and have you become a part of that history. I own Scarlett O'Hara's, Hoptinger, Shim Sham Room. I stayed because I have a lot of businesses and I was worried and I, want, I, I thought that maybe I could help in some way, shape or form, which is a big mistake. Stayed in a, in a penthouse on the 13th, 14th floor down on 11th South. Um, so we were, we were pretty good, we were hunkered down. There was probably uh, eight to 10 of us. We did go out on the balcony, it was really windy and uh, we were kind of holding on to the pillars and, and playing around that way, which again, wrong move to do. There was a, there's a couple areas on 12th Avenue South and a couple of the walkways. You can just see the, the foam of the wave coming up and going all the way onto 1st Street. There were a couple of houses that had their cars parked out in front, so you can see the water rising up the cars. It was, um, it was kind of uh, surreal to see you had all these areas that had these high dunes and then later there was nothing. They just got washed away. Um, and then that's when the water was breaking up through the through the walkways and up the streets. So we got very blessed because the storm went off further east. Um, had it taken the path that it was coming on, it could have been a lot worse. Everything can be replaced and lives can't be replaced. By mid-afternoon on Friday, October 7th, Hurricane Matthew raged just off the shores of Jacksonville. Instead of crashing into the coast as many had feared, a slight wobble in the hurricane's track just hours before moved it farther into the ocean. Ultimately, Matthew is only about 35, 45 miles off the, our coast. Depending if you live south of town near Flagler, it was very close to the coast. And that wobble was about 40 miles. We were not hit, but don't tell that to the people whose homes were damaged, because even without hitting us directly, Matthew caused a lot of damage. People began calling 911 to report emergencies. 911, where's your emergency? A tree has fallen across the road and has blocked 214. One of the most harrowing 911 calls came from a woman who was not even in the storm, but her loved ones were. They didn't evacuate, and my mother just called me, and the ocean water is surrounding their house. 
I don't know what to do. Can somebody help me? Okay. What's their address? Drive. Okay. My okay. dad is paralyzed, and she's my mother's up on the, the kitchen counter. What I don't think people understand is they, they think, well, I'm going to ride it out, and if there's some significant damage, I'm going to call the police or call the firemen. They're not there. So when we tell people you need to evacuate, it's not, it's not a, a light given suggestion. Channel 4 reporter Vic Michelucci felt the full weight of the absence of emergency workers. And I talked to the police officers before they left. I talked to the fire marshal before they left. And they said, be very careful, but whatever happens, there's not going to be a response. The fire marshal gave me his cell phone number and he said, call me if it gets really bad and we'll work something out. But it, it certainly is weird to be in a place where you're so used to just having 911 there in case of an emergency. And out here, there's no 911. They can't help you. With no help for those in the evacuated areas, it was time to hunker down for everyone who stayed behind. A life-threatening storm surge is still expected. There is no change there. Uh, people uh, that are now in their homes, uh, need to take this seriously. The one-two punch of high winds and heavy rain, coupled with a high tide, caused a host of problems. Yep, Surge has breached the dunes. It's, the water is rising as we speak. It's, it's higher now than it was when you guys came to me about two minutes ago. Got to take a look. This is the San Sebastian River. It has come over the train tracks. You can't even see the train tracks under there. You could when I joined you about 25 minutes ago, but now you cannot even see those tracks underneath this water. Biggest fear, flying debris. The, wind... the high ocean surge smashed into everything it came into contact with, wiping away protective dunes along the coast. We were on live and we saw from the camera, the water just, breaking through and coming into Jack's Beach. And I know it felt like at the time that you were watching from above like a scene from a movie or, or even like a, like, a, like a miniature. The power of Mother Nature never ceases to be awesome. It never ceases to be humbling, but to see the destructive power of Mother Nature and how much damage a hurricane can cause, it just takes your breath away. It was just chilling. We couldn't believe it was happening. If you were the beaches, you were the only thing in between the water and the hurricane and everyone else. Vic Michelucci rode out the storm in a Jacksonville beach parking garage. From his vantage point, he kept a close watch on the Jack's Beach Pier. It had been ripped away during Hurricane Floyd in 1999 and was rebuilt five years later. And this new one was supposed to be hurricane proof and built really strong and sturdy with these breakaway boards that came out. And I could see the boards breaking away, which is what they were designed to do to lessen the impact on the structure of the pier. And, and this is really heartbreaking though. This is not a hurricane party. Uh, the, the damage is, is, is terrible. And let me show you out here. Let me show you the Jacksonville Beach Pier. Now, obviously, it's just the pier, it's just property, but it shows the extent of the damage. Look at that, the pier is being ripped away as we speak. My estimate was about a third of the pier was gone. And that was when I said, oh no, because this is before the worst of the hurricane had come. And I said, if it can rip away this giant concrete structure, what else can it do to our coastline and to the people who live here? The storm surge was so strong, it cut a new inlet between the Atlantic Ocean and the Summer Haven River in St. Augustine. And when I briefed the governor, I remember um, using verbiage that this is gonna be the storm that generation after generation will talk about in our local area. I also remember um, briefing in that executive meeting that a surge of that magnitude and winds of that magnitude will reshape our coastline. Even though the storm didn't transpire, thankfully, uh, like what that forecast Thursday morning was looking like, we, we have had new inlets cut. Um, some barrier islands have been reshaped. 
Mayport 60 miles an hour, no longer getting the report out of Jack's Beach, 44 mile an hour wind out there towards the Buckman Bridge. Miles inland, high winds caused other problems. And I want to show you this church steeple has fallen off of the top of the church. As you can see, I've been trying to look and see what it's hanging on by. I can't tell, but it does not look good. Rough waves in the St. John's River demolished boat docks, and the high winds toppled dozens of trees and limbs, shutting down power. Well, the biggest challenge we had out in the field was the devastation of, to the tree canopy. Um, that was by far the, the, the biggest issue uh, that we faced. Paul McElroy is the chief executive officer of JEA, the electrical service provider for nearly half a million residents and business owners in Duval and Clay counties. At the height of this, it was in excess of 250,000 people. Hurricane Matthew caused thousands to lose power. Nearly all of JEA's 2,000 employees worked to get power up and running right after the storm. And eventually, 450 crews from seven states would come to help as well. We had all of our crews, uh, electric, water, and sewer crews, were ready to roll on, on Saturday morning. After making good headway, JEA officials publicly stated that everyone's power would be restored within days. That didn't happen. Utility repairs still have a long way to go, however. About 60,000 local residents are still without power. More than half of them are here in Jacksonville. Deadlines for getting everyone's lights back on continue to be missed. The JEA made a terrible mistake by saying that they were going to get everybody's power back on by midnight Monday. If they had to do it all over again, they would never say that, I'm sure. It was an optimistic prediction, but people heard it, we broadcast it. You expect that power to be back on, and then it wasn't. People were real unhappy. Katie Kamula was one of them. All right, JEA, come on, come get my power back on. Katie's power was off for 11 days. Not only was it tough on her and her four kids, it was dangerous for her baby son, Cameron. He was born prematurely with health problems that required a sleep apnea monitor. No power meant Cameron could die. Especially babies who, you know, stop breathing in the middle of the night, you're not alarmed to that. You, you sleep right through it. And that machine would send off an alarm and we'd be right there. You'd, uh, you know, tap his feet, wake him, call him by his name, and he would just, it would startle him to breathe again. A Channel 4 reporter was interviewing Katie after the storm when a JEA crew finally arrived to restore her power. Oh my God, we have power! Oh my God, I feel it. Please don't go. I did cry. <laughs> it was just, you know, you get so frustrated. And you, I mean, I have no family down here. I don't really have many friends. Finally getting that relief of, I can take care of my family now. Again, I have the means to take care of my family. That's all I'm about, my kids. So it was emotional, and as you can tell, it's still emotional. Channel 4 weatherman Richard Nunn and his wife Cindy also lost their power. I call it four days. Uh, Cindy would tell you that it's four days and X amount of hours and minutes on down the road, but it was four long days. It was made even longer by the fact that Richard was still working overtime at the station and getting virtually no rest at home. You've got open doors and windows, it's humid, it's muggy, and you've got the roar in the background of generators. I got very, very little sleep, and not only that, my generator would only run for about three hours before it would run out of gas. So every two and a half hours, my alarm was going off for me to get up, and go and refill the generator, and, and then try to get a little bit of sleep before having to come back into work. Like Katie Kamula, Mayor Lenny Curry was frustrated at the length of time it was taking for power to be restored. He publicly urged citizens to tweet him if their power was still out. If you're the last person to get restored, I recognized the pain of that individual and that family. So there was no moment in my mind where we could pat ourselves on the back and rest on accomplishments because as long as someone had been without power, struggling for food and water, uh, we needed to make sure that, we, that they knew that we cared about them 
and we were, we were coming to help them and restore their power. McElroy, who was out of state attending his daughter's wedding when the hurricane hit, says they underestimated the length of time it would take to clear fallen trees from smaller roads. That is what ultimately held up power restoration for people like Katie and her family. In hindsight, um, you know, we should have continued to, to state that we are going to seek any and all help and continue to work as safely and as quickly as we can in restoring power. I've been with uh, the individuals and I can tell you they put their, their complete uh, heart and mind and body into restoring power, take this uh, personally, um, professionally, and have every intent to, to do the best job we possibly can. Saturday, October 8th, the day after the storm, a day of assessment. For some, a day of disbelief. It reached four feet above the stools. All the stools were underwater completely when we got in. This is rough. Depressed. Um, that we're all healthy, everything's good. Well, Just the pubs in total, total disarray. This is the walkway that goes over into the ocean. And take a look at how far we are from the ocean. We're about a block and a half. So some students brought out the kayaks, they're walking through the water. This used to be the Sunrise Surf Shop. It appears that there is structural damage. Hurricane Matthew was especially punishing in St. John's and Flagler counties. Along the coast, clearly uh, 50 to 100 homes either severely damaged or totally damaged, destroyed. You can find again along the waterways, the St. John's River something I hadn't even considered to be so bad. All the piers, the docks destroyed. We're talking about hundreds of docks destroyed because of the winds. Many beachfront homes on Volano Beach were pulverized by the storm surge. In Flagler County, the high waves washed out a part of coastal highway A1A, and the wave action tossed boats around like toys. Oh, look at that wow. boat back there. There's a dose of reality for that particular boat owner. It's sitting on its side. For Jacksonville's beaches residents, the decision was made early on to get people back into their homes as soon as it was safe to do so. I began asking uh, the night of the storm, my team, what's it gonna take to get people back into the beach? And what we heard was based on history, uh, there was just this assumption that it would take uh, maybe days. And I got on the phone with the governor, talked about the bridges, we gotta make sure the bridges are safe. The governor was committed to making sure those bridges had been inspected. And once bridges were cleared, which is what I wanted first thing in the morning, the governor was committed to that. I wanted to go to the people of Jacksonville on Saturday and say, you can go back home. And we were able to do that. Again, that comes back to planning and preparation in the middle of the crisis. If we had waited to have all these discussions after the storm uh, was gone, it, it would have taken much longer. I know that a lot of people would have liked to, to get the city open faster than noon on Saturday, but I can assure you it was a Herculean effort to get it done by noon on Saturday. That says a lot to the planning, execution, and the recovery that we went through with Matthew passing by. In St. John's County, National Guard troops kept vehicles from crossing the bridge to get onto Anastasia Island. People were just walking, and I just remember the images from that thinking it was like refugees. I saw moms pushing babies and strollers over the bridge because even though you couldn't drive, everyone wanted to know what was happening on the other side. So my photographer and I, we set out on our own two mile trek and we crossed the bridge and you came up and I just remember the overwhelming smell of water damage. So I found this one family who were walking to check on their house. They hadn't made, their, made it there yet. And it was a dad, his girlfriend, their dog, and a little girl named Evelyn. She was six years old. We're going to check our house in case if it's damaged or not damaged. She just was like, Miss Lindsay, I just hope all my toys are okay. I have a hundred toys and I've just thought about them the whole storm. And if, if they're okay, I'll be okay. I bet there's a tree on my school. She went to R.B. Hunt Elementary. I bet there, I bet there is, but I just want to make sure that my toys are okay. So we came up on our house and you could tell that the sandbags were wet you knew that they had gotten hit hard. And we went in and the, the, the wall of the smell hit you and Evelyn just took off. Let me check my room. Oh, it's wet right here. Definitely my room is safe, thank goodness. 
the toys. Survive. It was devastation at their home, but to watch the wonder of a child and and the happiness that that little girl felt, the joy she felt, really just put it all in perspective for me. There was another little girl that was never far from Lindsay's mind during the storm. Sadie, her baby, that she didn't even get a chance to kiss goodbye before she was evacuated to her grandparents' house. Soon after the storm, mother and daughter were reunited. It's all kind of a blur. It was organized chaos uh, at the time. Still to come, an up-close look at extensive damage Matthew inflicted on the Jack's Beach Pier and what it's going to take to fix it. Plus... It was the most life-changing event in my life. Coming to grips with the future after a hurricane wipes nearly everything away. When I saw the video of all that water coming in, at that point I was not here, but I cried because I knew we were gonna lose stuff. We saw most of it coming in from the inland waterway over here, and we could see it just coming in and coming in, and it was not stopping. Once they let the roads open, that was when we came back on. Again, all the neighbors basically were here with us too. And again, we all opened up their doors. We thought, ooh, it looks good outdoors. Opened up the doors and were met with the reality of the mud and the stench and all the disaster in the house. We had a water line approximately here. I've never been in a disaster like this ever in my life. And it, it was traumatic. It was extremely traumatic. I still love living here. Um, I said jokingly to my father, I said I probably will just buy indoor outdoor furniture from now on because it, it will float. So. It's been months since Hurricane Matthew walloped Northeast Florida and the damage is still evident. So this is our pier. You can tell that we're still in a shape of disarray, a little unsafe, so we're keeping it locked. The pier that Vic Michalucci watched get battered and beaten during the storm is now eerily deserted. Planks are missing, and 300 feet of the pier simply washed away. Here's an example of some of the wood popping up. And this is as far as we're going to be able to go. A design firm has been chosen to evaluate the pier, and it's estimated to cost about $7 million to rebuild it. Like most things battered by Matthew, money and patience are a must. In Volano Beach, the damage that remains can only be described as astonishing. The most dramatic of the damage was the beachfront homes, particularly in our southern counties. And to see homes where there was no land under the front half of the home anymore, there was no sand under them. This house remains untouched all these months later. Its foundation washed out from beneath it. Its walls collapsed leaving the inside exposed. I go out and witness the damage, and it chokes me up. You know, I get emotionally choked up seeing other people hurt. I'm a meteorologist. I forecast for folks to prepare. But when you see the damage and you see the impact on lives, it, uh, it really hurts. It, it, get, it gets into my heart. We escaped. We got lucky. You know, if you look back, you know, not for a 30 mile wobble, we would have had a really, really serious situation in Jacksonville. It was a great escape for most. With the exception of Flagler County, no other counties in Northeast Florida experienced sustained hurricane force winds. The category four storm that was forecasted weakened considerably when it got close to Duval County. In an in-depth report about Matthew, National Hurricane Center scientists estimate that the hurricane's wind and water caused about $10 billion in damage. More than 1 million structures were impaired by the storm, making Matthew the 10th most destructive hurricane to affect the United States. And lives were lost, 585 of them. The vast majority in Haiti 25 people died in North Carolina, mainly from floodwaters, and two women died in Florida. One in Putnam County and one in Volusia County when trees fell on them. Rocks and stuff. 
um, this partition was torn off and then all these booths were smashed into the kitchen and they were um, just pushed right through the kitchen. Remember Joan Galasso? She's the owner of the Matanzas Inlet Restaurant the restaurant that was battered and beaten by Hurricane Matthew will soon be brought down by a bulldozer. And even though it's been eight months since Matthew hit, Joan won't ever forget the first time she and her husband saw the mess Matthew made. As we came across the bridge and we came into the parking lot, we saw our walk-in box and freeze it in the middle of the parking lot. We had been ripped off not only the foundation, but off the side of the it was anchored to the wall as well. And it was loaded with food. And um, it just, it was a heavy thing to have moved. Um, our deck was gone, our gazebo's gone, our walls are gone, our equipment was all tumbled. It's just incredible, the force of the water. The hurricane hit the Golasso's hard, and not just the restaurant they've owned for the past 25 years. Matthew also forced floodwaters into their home and cars. It was a surreal, scene looking out my window and watching people's boats and docks and lawn furniture, everything you can imagine floating down the street. It was just, it was unreal, or surreal. <laughs> it was both, um, but it was, I don't, hope I never see anything like it again. <laughs> Patrons are wondering if they'll see the restaurant rise again. There's no easy answer. Like many, the Galassos are trying to get what they call a fair settlement from the insurance company. We're still fighting them. Um, our attorney is still working on it. We've had a public adjuster and we've had some money come in, uh, but we still have not, we feel like we haven't exhausted every bit of money and in order to rebuild here we're going to need every bit of money it's not going to be it's not going to be a quick fix at this point we're trying to keep all our options open we don't want to really commit to to saying yes we're rebuilding or no we're not rebuilding so we just don't know one thing Joan does know she respects the power of hurricanes more than ever after seeing Matthew's fury took away not only my, our livelihood, but our life. This was our life. We worked here 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, my kids would grew up here. All my children worked here throughout their high school and college years, uh, their summers. Um, it, took away, it took away our sense of, of community here. Each hurricane that goes by, we learn a little bit more but preparation still is key. And individually, anybody who's watching this, you know what mistakes you personally made. You didn't get the hotel room that you wanted. You didn't get ready to go soon enough. Uh, you didn't prepare certain snacks. The kids weren't happy, you weren't happy. There are all these little tiny things that can make your life better the next time a Matthew-like hurricane comes by. One of the lessons learned and the opportunities for improvement that we have taken away from Hurricane Matthew is we need to break down the, evacu the storm surge for our community. And we need to speak very specific and clarify that it's not only the Atlantic Ocean, it's going to be the intercoastal and the St. Johns River that will surge. The second thing is insurance is complex. FEMA is complex. People have flood insurance, people have hurricane wind insurance, people have vehicle insurance. But when you don't use those policies every day, it becomes very complicated as to which policy pays for which part of the damage. And those are conversations that we need to continue to have with the insurance industry, the, the federal government on the flood insurance side, so people understand how those policies apply and how long it could take before those policies pay out. Make sure you've got flood insurance. And uh, make sure you're ready. If your house is below the base flood elevation, make sure you take those steps necessary if there is a hurricane coming that it could possibly flood, make sure you can protect your house as best as possible. If people had stayed and if that storm had not uh, jostled to the right at the last minute, 
um, people would have died. Houses would have been completely destroyed. People would be hanging on to trees and winds of uh, 85 to 100 knots, hoping that they could hold on. Now imagine your kids trying to keep them protected at the same time. Uh, a lot of the structures will fail. A lot of the roofs will come in. Uh, hurricanes also breed tornadoes. Tornadoes can decimate houses. Um, there's a lot of reasons for you to leave. Uh, and there's, a, there's, there's not many to stay. There's not many good reasons to stay. If you think you can stay and make it better for your house, I can assure you, you cannot. We will get a category for making landfall on our coast at some point. And uh, when it does, I, I really hope that our, our residents here uh, respond uh, proactively, not reactively. We're still on the hook for the future that we could still easily get a major hurricane into Jacksonville or Northeast Florida, Southeast Georgia in my lifetime. In fact, I expect it to happen. It's inevitable for us not to have something like that happen again, but I would just say, knock on wood, that maybe it'll be a nice quiet year. The time to prepare for a hurricane is now. Go to news4jax.com hurricane to find out what to have in a survival kit, what your insurance may cover, and other vital information. Thank you.